Hey, y'all. I'm Bud Elliott, and this is my College Football Summer School Series on Cover 3. I bring on the team experts from the 24-7 sports staff and ask them the questions I care about. No fluff. Which players will be toughest to replace? What position groups are sneakily better or worse than I realize? We get you the scoop on each team in 20 minutes or less. Let's go. Hey, guys. Bud Elliott here. Welcome back to the Cover 3 College Football Podcast. And today, we're going to do a little summer school. Texas A&M with Carter Carls, Gigum 24-7. Carter, welcome to the show. Thanks, bud. Appreciate you having me, man. Yeah, man. So, interesting year last year. Fun time to drop in on on the beat. Uh, five and seven, which is kind of shocking to be honest. Did play like the power ratings say they played at the top thirty five level. Uh, opponent adjustments playing the SEC plus Miami doing a lot of work there. Schedule was top ten by a lot of people's standards, including mine. Uh, a weird year like they lost to that zombie auburn team and then they i guess they got <laughs> sick against florida and, and and lost to florida and yet they they pretty soundly beat like an lsu team to to you know, get to that fifth win I, what do you make of what happened last year yeah that, that really was a crazy year i think really what it boils down to uh i mean it boils down to a lot of things but Quarterback play injuries had, had a big role in that. I don't think they felt comfortable about quarterback really until that Ole Miss game where Connor Wigman comes in and, and kind of lights it up. But but really that was kind of a, a one game deal until LSU. Then you then you saw, okay, well, this guy actually may have something. This guy actually may be deserving of that five star rating he got as a recruit. But before that, you know, it's really been a two year drought at quarterback for them with cycling through Haynes King and Zach Calzada and Max Johnson. They just really didn't have an answer there. They had a lot of injuries at the position. Uh, their offensive line play was really poor as well. You know, you got all these skill guys, you got all these five stars everywhere, but if you don't have good quarterback play or good offensive line play, you're just not going to be very good. And so I think that really limited their offense, not to mention tons of, tons of problems offensively. I think they, just uh, couldn't kind of figure it out against these lower opponents. And they got up for the big games. You know, they got up against Bama, Ole Miss, LSU. But when it came to the Auburns of the world, the South Carolinas of the world, they looked like a completely different team. So kind of played up to their competition, kind of played down. Also couldn't defend the run very well. And that showed up in, in some of those games as well. But, yeah, lots of problems. Uh, they think they've addressed some of them, but – yeah, it, it was not great. So they bring in Bobby Petrino, who has a better offensive track record, I, I guess, for the most part than Jimbo does. Jimbo does have like the highest scoring offense in college ball history in 2013. He also had every, every starter on that team drafted. So you know, it, it, a lot of it had to do, I think, with talent acquisition there. Do you think that, that Jimbo Fisher is going to let Bobby Petrino run his offense the way that he wants to run it? For now, <laughs> okay. that, that's kind of my answer is for now, I think he will. He has kind of given him the reins this offseason as far as recruiting decisions, transfer decisions. Uh, really, when you talk to these recruits, these transfers, Bobby Petrino is very, very involved in a lot of these decisions, coaching personnel decisions. So I think that kind of is a good sign. He's been a little hesitant to openly just say it as, as clear as day. Hey, I'm not doing play calling anymore. But he has indicated that uh, a little a little begrudgingly. And so I think he'll start off Bobby Petrino calling the plays. My biggest question is what happens if things go wrong? You know, game four, game five, you get to Arkansas and you have three points at halftime. Like, is that going to change? Will, will Jimbo be willing to – Say, hey, you know, you see it all the time in the NFL and college. People give up play calling, and then when things go wrong, they take it back. And so that's my biggest question. Uh, if things go wrong, how will that change? It was basically the Gus Malzahn plan, right? In, in an odd-numbered year, he'd call the plays. In an even-numbered year, the boosters would get mad. and be like, oh, this guy's the play caller this year. And then by, by Halloween, he'd, he'd take it back anyway. You mentioned Connor Wegman, freshman quarterback. Last year on the positive side, he didn't throw any interceptions, which is huge. Part of that might be because he really didn't take very many chances. A 37% success rate is just as bad as like a Virginia or Virginia Tech or, or a West Virginia or, or some of those just objectively horrible uh, passing offenses. Is it safe to assume that he is going to be the starter? And if so, 
Are, are you expecting a big time jump? I think he has to be the starter. I, I think those Ole Miss and LSU games showed you what he can do. I, I think some of those numbers are skewed with with the Auburn game and and the UMass game. And they they had like games where they had suspensions, they had receivers that were out. You, you talk about the Moose Muhammad game where he didn't play because he didn't he was wearing sleeves on his uh, on his arms and and. That was a rule on the team. If you wear sleeves, you can't play. Uh, so that, that was another reason. But uh, I think he's shown that he can make those throws down the field. It's just having the time to do that and, and having the scheme to do that. Uh, and I think, you know, maybe having a more healthy offensive line can help. But this guy really does have a lot of playmakers uh, when you project where a guy like Evan Stewart could be next year mentioned Moose Muhammad, uh, Donovan Green, I think could make a big jump at tight end uh, next season. So I think he does make that jump. Um, I, I do think that like, can he be a top 15 quarterback in college football? Can he be a top three in SEC? I don't know if he's there yet. I still think there's so many questions to answer with this offense, but he can, he can definitely be better than what they had the last couple of years. And uh, that might be enough to win you seven and eight games. Devin A. Chain last year, pretty important to that offense, 245 touches on, on offense and plus whatever he had on special teams. Who do you project to replace those carries and, and what sort of drop off, if any, uh, do you project? I think they're going to have a running back by committee. They really have three guys in there with uh, Le'Veon Moss, Amari Daniels, and the, the true freshman, Ruben Owens, who was a five star recruit. Uh, I think it's going to be those three guys. They've, they've added a couple transfers like David Bailey, who got a lot of time at Boston College, was at Colorado State most recently. But I think it really mostly will be those three guys. They, they kind of bit, bring a little bit of a different uh, skill set. Amari Daniels is kind of more your home run hitter. Le'Veon Moss is kind of your guy that will fight for the extra yard, fall forward, and, and, and can get you those five, six-yard runs. Uh, and Ruben Owens is someone who – and I think this guy could really be special. He's got great vision, uh, great acceleration, really all the things you look for in a running back. So it could be one of those things where Moss and Daniels are your 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 main guys uh, at the beginning of the season. And then I think Owens, as the season progresses as a true freshman, could uh, overtake that role. So uh, he's one to watch for sure. I think he is the future of that room, but – Jimbo Fisher is also very high on Le'Veon Moss, so he's also one to watch for sure. Does this receiver room have a potential to be sneakily really good? Like Anaya Smith coming back healthy, Evan Stewart, Moose Muhammad. I don't know, Mal. You can get in trouble dreaming on Texas A&M, but if if it works, <laughs> it's because these guys are good, right? Like this is the path. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I, this is this is the group that. I mean, the D-line's pretty talented, too, but wide receiver, I might be most confident in that position in terms of production because uh, this is the, the crazy thing. Noah Thomas, a guy that doesn't get talked about as much as Moose Muhammad, Anaya Smith, Evan Stewart, he's the guy that won MVP of the spring for a and They think that guy could be one of their best playmakers uh, this season. I think they've got four guys that they really feel good about at wide receiver. I think Evan Stewart, you know, I've seen these these lists of rank the top 10, rank the top 15 receivers, in college football. I think he should be in that top group. I don't know top 10. That, that might be too much for now. He's got to kind of prove it. But I really do think he can be in that group this season. Moose Muhammad, I think, is another guy who could eventually be a middle round pick. Noah Thomas uh, is a guy, a bigger receiver that I think will be special. So, yeah, I think that group, I think, is very solid. I mentioned Donovan Green as well. I think he's the alpha of that tight end group. So I think that's the strength of the team for sure. So you would include tight end as a strength or just kind of overall pass catchers as a strength? I was curious about tight end. Pass catchers, you know, I, I don't feel amazing about the, the depth. I mean, they, they like how they all fill a different niche. Like Max Wright's a six-year guy. Not going to catch a lot of passes, but a, a decent blocking tight end. Jake Johnson and, and the Sweden guy, Theo mellon Olstrom, they're both guys that could be good maybe a year or two down the road, but 
what I've seen in the spring so far, I'm not quite sold on them yet, but Donovan Green's the one guy that, that really did stand out to me. He had 200, 300 yards last year as a true freshman. Uh, I think this is a year where he can get in maybe that 500 receiving yard range if, if things go well for him. So I think he can be a pretty productive guy for sure. None of this works unless the offensive line gets a whole lot better. Uh, last year, they were actually dead last in the nation in pressure rate allowed, which is tough to do, but again, a tough schedule. And they did deal with a decent number of injuries. They also lost a really good offensive line coach and replaced him with Steve Adazio, which I'm not going to ask you to comment on a guy you have to cover like this, but it kind of shocked me personally the way that things ended at Colorado State, that that would be who they chose to, to bring in, given the kind of player mutiny thing they had going on there. Uh, is this a coaching thing? Is it just an injury thing? Because everybody who played last year basically is back. I, I, what kind of jump are you expecting here, if if any? Yeah, this is the group I'm the least confident in on the whole team, for sure. Uh, it's injuries, it's talent, it's coaching. Uh, I don't feel good about a lot with the group. I think the thing that they can sell is that they feel good about starters the depth I'm very concerned about, especially an offensive tackle. You know, they're, they're starters just kind of projecting the group, Trey Zoon at left tackle, Ruben Fathery, right tackle. Then the guards, you, you got Lane Robinson right, Cam Dewberry left, center, Bryce Foster. Uh, at offensive tackle, if one of those guys goes down, they'll probably be putting in a, a true freshman in there in Chase Passanis. And uh, I think he's a, going to be a pretty good player. But asking a true freshman in the SEC to deliver an offensive tackle, it's a, it's a big ask. Uh, and you just don't really have a lot of great guys to, to feel about. And as you know, transfer portal, it's hard to find those offensive tackles. They couldn't find any of them in there. So, yeah, they're going to kind of rely on a lot of unproven guys if there are injuries. And there have been a lot of injuries with this group over the last couple of years. You know, that 2020 offensive line, was probably top three in, in college football. Uh, since then, it's taken a real nosedive. And uh, I just – I think they've got a lot of guys who – you know, they got the kind of offensive line maybe of, of old where it's a lot of big guys, a lot, a lot of strength there, but not a lot of a quickness and not a lot of, you know, athleticism. So I just – you know, like the depth concerns, the injuries and the coaching, everything about it – I. I I'm feeling a little weird about. So, yeah. One of the questions. One of the questions that we ask here is, uh, wh where's the biggest drop off between starters and backups? And I feel like you just answered that. So, <laughs> we, we'll skip <laughs> one of those answers on on, on the end. Uh, so they, they lose Mike Elko last year, and D, DJ Durkin comes in from Old Miss. I personally thought it was going to be a downgrade, but they turned in a top twenty defense despite you know some defensive injuries. This is the unit that basically carried the team. And now the defensive line returns. Unless I'm missing somebody, everybody who played at least 100 snaps is is back. Like, this is potentially a really great D-line, right? Oh, yeah. I feel, feel very good about this defensive line. I think it's a year Walter Nolan takes a big job. You saw him in the, the spring game make, make a few big flash plays. Uh, McKinley Jackson's a guy that's been around for a long time. And really, I mean, that 2022 class, everyone laughs. Like, my gosh, all those defense alignment. But, you know, it's a numbers game. You expect a couple, few of those to pop. And I think, you know, you mentioned Walter Nolan. Uh, you know, Shamar Stewart's another guy from the 2021 class. Uh, Shamar Turner, I think, is someone who could take a big jump. Uh, really, the, the I think the biggest uh, difference that we want to see in, in this group is – more sack production. They, they did struggle to, to generate a lot of sacks. Um, this defense also did struggle against the run, uh, which I think speaks a little bit more of the, the linebacking play. But, uh, yeah, those are two areas of growth that, that they'll need to make, and I think they will with, with this talented group and the depth that they have. I was going to ask you about that. So Durkin is pretty notorious for not wanting to blitz, going back to his time even at Maryland and, and certainly at Ole Miss. They just did not blitz. They played a lot of kind of three-down limit explosive plays, try to win in the red zone, which is a formula a lot of teams use to success. I'm, I'm not going to knock it, but you do need somebody to get some edge pressure. And I I look at this depth chart, I'm like I love all these guys they have that are 285 plus. Where are the edge rushers? Is there somebody you have a lot of confidence in to 
to step up and be that edge pressure guy? That, that's a good point. A lot of 270, 280 pound guys who are monstrous. You look at them at, at you, you go to practice, you're like, wow, that guy is an athlete, but getting around the edge, closing on the sack, Shamar Turner won where he, you know, got a ton of pressures last year, but he had 0.5 sacks, you know? So he's someone that you look at, you say, okay, he looked a step quicker this spring. Maybe he could be the guy. Uh, he's on the defensive line. So it can be a little bit of a challenge when he's playing D tackle and, and D end. And, and then two other guys that I would mention who aren't starters, but they're guys that will get some playing time. Unai White and Malik Sia, they're, they're two guys that you can, you can, they're not going to have their, their hand down all the time. They can, you know, they can use them kind of as that like outside linebacker type where they can blitz off the edge. Uh, so I think those are two guys that they could use creatively. Uh, yeah, the three down linemen, that, that's like the biggest, uh, if you mention three down linemen to any a &M fan, they will, uh, they'll freak out. So they want to see less of that this year to hopefully defend the run better. But like, if you have three big bodies that you can play some some good three down stuff, they they, they can eat gaps and and I mean most teams don't have three really good you know two eighty plus type body. If a name does, I I don't think it's crazy to play that. But you know I sure. I understand. I guess people equate it. A lot of it comes down to how much do you want to blitz from a three down, right? Like like Durkin doesn't want, doesn't want to blitz. There are some guys that play three down and and bring the house certainly. Uh, if a and M was a an NFL team, they would be trading one of these big defensive tackles for some linebacker help. Perhaps I, these numbers yeah. just aren't good. Like, it, is it going to be the veterans stepping up? Is there a young guys ready to, to break out? What, what do you see here? Cause I'm, I'm, I'm a little sketch on this, I guess. Yeah, probably the big, biggest question on defense corner. You have some questions with depth, but linebacker, when we talk about starters, definitely has the, the biggest question, uh, they did bring in a guy from Jackson State and Juriente Davis, J.D. Davis, who they think they could use a little creatively. Cooper and, and Chris Russell are two guys that have played a lot of snaps, do have a lot of experience. I think the hope with them is, hey, all the guys around them are pretty good, so maybe that uh, relieves some of the, the pressure off of them. Uh, but, yeah, they definitely need to, to make that jump this season because – a lot, a lot to be desired last year. Interesting that you said, you know, corner was kind of a minor concern here because they, they lose Jalen Jones, they lose Denver Harris, and they also lost Antonio Johnson at secondary. It sounds like you have some confidence that, that the guys stepping up to take their places should be pretty good. Who, who do you like there? Yeah, outside, you got Tyreek Chappelle, who I think he could be an all SEC caliber cornerback, a pretty good player. Tony Grimes, uh, they brought in from North Carolina. Former five-star recruit was a guy that's played probably around 30 games at, at North Carolina. Uh, a lot of experience. I think he was all ACC two years ago, second team. So he's someone that can play at a pretty good level. If he's your number two cornerback, you feel pretty solid there. Uh, at nickel, uh, Bryce Anderson uh, is someone that I think could be the best defensive back on this team. Uh, he's someone I think will be playing on Sundays in the future. And behind him, they brought in a guy that has played a lot of football and Josh DeBerry from Boston College. ACC, yeah. Uh, yeah. Three team, all ACC guy. Um, he's someone that like was playing on such a bad team that it, it, it's hard to understand just how good he was, but Hey, three time, all ACC, and he might be your backup. Uh, that's pretty strong, but he's also someone who's pretty versatile that can bring him in for dime packages that can, put him outside, inside. He's been a little bit more, uh, a lot better at uh, nickel. Um, and I think it's going to be hard for him to win that starting job over Bryce Anderson. I'm telling you, Bryce Anderson is going to be really special. But Josh DeBerry, it, it, to have him as at least a backup, I think it's going to make that group really strong. Carter Carl's planting that flag for Bryce Anderson, giving us the scoop on Texas a and Really appreciate you joining us here on Summer School. Yes, sir. Thanks for having me, bud.